Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Marijuana Resolve show taped here in downtown Brattleboro in the BCTV studios. Uh, with me is our co-host, Daryl Pillsbury, and today we are here to welcome a very special guest. Uh, many of you uh, know this gentleman. Uh, he's, he's is a candidate. He has recently won a primary. And uh, I'd like you all to extend a warm welcome to Tristan Tolino, candidate for our Vermont State Legislature. Welcome, Tristan. Thank you very much. Glad I'm, to be here. I'm good. I'm glad that we, for, you know, Darren and I are very glad that you could come. And, um, you know, we, uh, as you know, since this is the Marijuana Resolve Show, this is, this is a chance to talk to you as a candidate about marijuana issues. I thought this was a food show. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted well, to talk to you about. Oh, when you used to you, follow me on the radio, me, <laughs> when you used to follow me on the radio show, you used to bring treats. That's right. I came to this. Joe thought we were going to eat. I told Joe we got Tristan coming. He'll bring us in a treat. No treats. I know Joe. Oh, I, I no you. treats for Joe. I, I Joe. came right from a meeting. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you, you're going to have a lot of them now, Tristan. I suspect so. <laughs> Ironically, you can eat marijuana. This is true. Uh, <laughs> and I was wondering what kind of treats Daryl was going to bring. <laughs> Um, You're a candidate now, uh, and when we won a primary, we got to be cool about that stuff. I didn't want to give you no, no brownies. No brownies <laughs> this time, so. That's good, um, but uh, we certainly would like to have a chance to talk with you about yeah. the issue of marijuana, because um, as most of Vermonters know, the, the uh, New York State Legislature has, uh, in the past, passed the, uh, the medical marijuana bills. Uh, re last uh, session, they passed the uh, medical marijuana of dispensary bills and so I think two uh, of the four dispensaries have been allocated mm -hmm. um, the bill is designed to cover about a thousand patients um, and, um, and, uh, and and according to Jeanette White Senator Jeanette White uh, they're really kind of starting out slow so mm -hmm. that they can sort of build up to let's see how these work and where do we go from there so what that does is leave the gap of the what, what I refer to as the least harmful uh, bill, or in, or better said, a major harm reduction move, which is decriminalization of marijuana, and that applies to the broad body of of what is probably up to a hundred thousand people in Vermont alone who consume. Uh, marijuana. So the medicalization of marijuana will, will, will help a small, very small, narrow load of patients and decriminalization will help everyone who's involved with marijuana. Uh, do you have any, any sense of, of, of that, um, of, the, of decrim itself? Sure. Uh, well, I was actually asked this question uh, when I was on uh, Steve West show about a month ago uh, with Kate O'Connor, who I was running against in the, in the primary. And I think I'll try to answer it consistently with what I said then. Uh, in some ways, I think we already have an informal decriminalization policy for low quantities, uh, which is, is fine as a precursor to thinking about this issue on a more sort of global level. Um, but what I, what I would like to see is for us to understand big picture how we get to a, a status where it is decriminalized for um, small quantities uh, universally and that's clear and that is not sort of a de facto system where prosecutors aren't really paying a whole lot of attention to it you know police officers are kind of looking the other way or whatever however it, it's functioning it's very informal um, and, and that's I guess in general as a general policy thing I think that uh, Policy should reflect change that's already happening whenever possible. And in this case, you know, we have change happening culturally. We have change happening with the dispensaries. Uh, where we're starting to think about the problem in a different way, and I think the policy should move in that direction and do so carefully and strategically. Um, you know, I I know that there are people who, uh, professional people, and particularly in the criminal justice world, who disagree uh, with this strategy and. I guess I would say from what research I've done, my inclination is that, or I guess my conclusion has been uh, that it seems like the evidence is really um, that that decriminalizing it does not lead to uh, increases, in, you know, as a gateway drug 
uh, issue seems like actually alcohol is much more of the gateway drug than anything else, um, and that their marijuana really isn't causally connected to other drug use in a significant way. And I think what, what I like is that we're actually talking about it constructively as a country, as a state, as a culture, uh, and maybe we can have a more rational <laughs> policy uh, going forward. That's uh, excellently said, actually, because, he, and you're right, I mean, he's right about yeah, no, no. General Sorrell, for instance, uh, already has a, a, a form of harm reduction built in by making, uh, you know, the, uh, gen the attorney general makes uh, marijuana possession and use as a low priority already, uh -huh. so, the, so the de facto uh, decrim now it's not sanctified by law, but, but, but General Sorrell apparently feels strongly about doing it that way. And of course, T.J. Donovan in the primaries was also very much mm -hmm. uh, in favor of, um, of, of D. Krim. And, uh, and so your idea of, uh, <clears throat> of the change of making it, uh, of uh, at, le at least it's got to be um, something that comes up in the 013 and 014 legislative session. Mm -hmm. While 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 he's we're there, hoping. we're hoping that um, that uh, that the legislature takes it up in 013. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because. Once we, uh, the longer you put it off, you know, even though there's a de facto decrim now, it's still better to have it in law. What it also does is it kicks in uh, if there's going to be a fine. For instance, Massachusetts has a has a penalty for um, a hundred dollars, you know, in in a, in a non-arrest scenario, like a traffic. Coup. Fine. Mm -hmm. That's right. Where they where they just uh, get something more or less like a ticket. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the issue of not having a criminal record, which is really important. Yeah. Um, and um, we need a way to protect underage people. And ironically, the hardest part and penalties of the decrim is this is the Massachusetts model that I'm referring to. <coughs> Excuse me. Is um, what they do for for under people under seventeen, I think it's seventeen or under or yes. like that. Okay, and um, <laughs> and that is where where there's compulsory drug awareness. They have a parental notification and things like that. So when you're in the legislature, how do you feel? I mean, if you if you were to craft a bill, would many of these things be incorporated in that? Well, so there's a lot there. <laughs> yes, there the is. It's I won't not... have the answers to all of it. <clears throat> right. Um, let me, I want, I want to focus on the kid, the younger people part of this Good. because I, Great. in, um, the viewers may not notice, know this about me, but I was a chef at Riverview Cafe. I was the partner there, uh, operating partner there for 11 years. And I employed over 400 people in 11 years, uh, from the Brattleboro area. And many of those were young people. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when you work with a lot of young people, a lot of teenagers particularly, you kind of get a sense of where their lives are at and what issues they're facing. And, you know, I had several, um, well, I had, you know, several different sort of anecdotal experiences that impact how I feel about decriminalizing marijuana, but also just, you know, about its use. So I'm in favor of its decriminalizing, uh, you know, I think that makes sense as a policy. Um, it's a really big pain when your employees are using it and you're expecting them to perform well, um, because at least when they're teenagers, because they often, you know, do not perform well. And so, like, it's not that I want there to be a blanket, you know, it's, it's how to explain this. So there's, it's like alcohol, it's like anything else. There are consequences to its use. I don't think those consequences should be criminal. I think it's part of teaching kids how to be adults. Exactly. And so That's there's that. That's a good that. point, Matt. I've heard you said that way exactly. before. You know, and, <clears throat> and so being adult means showing up on time. It means being mm -hmm. ready to work. Right. Being ready to work means, you know, you didn't video game all night. Maybe you're not stoned. You didn't drink before you came. Uh, you didn't get into a fight with a boyfriend or girlfriend and be unable to focus on anything. I had a diabetic uh, employee right. who didn't regulate his sugars well, and when he wasn't regulating his sugars well because he didn't want to, he liked to ride his uh, sugar waves, and he'd get like really manic oh, when his sick. sugar waves were going a particular way, and he'd do that on purpose. Um, you know, right. all of those are part of being a responsible adult. <laughs> employee, a citizen in this world. And I think it's 
anything that we talk about really comes back to if we at the policy level say you're going to be an adult and you're going to make adult decisions and you're going to have a framework for making adult decisions as a culture we then need to support and encourage intelligent behavior we need to recognize when it impacts in the work environment or the school environment or anything else so the other thing about young kids is that I had a number of young kids who you know, got um, sort of in the crosshairs of the local uh, police department um, largely because they liked to go off in a car and sit in a parking lot and get stoned and I you know they the safe spots that they thought they had were exactly like the top 10 list of where the police would look so there was a mismatch there between what they thought was effectively hiding and what the police thought um, and so they got caught you know repeatedly and it created a lot of tension it cost them a lot of money and so as a policymaker, I'm thinking, you know, so we, we want them to be responsible. We want them to be grown-ups and make good decisions. But we also need to then have behavioral interventions that are appropriate to kids. And if we tell them, you need to go to drug counseling, well, you know what? That drug counseling is not really what is an issue there and isn't going to necessarily help them to make better choices. And so it's all part of this complex system of parents and policy and kids growing up and learning how to function as adults and I just I want to make sure that any policy that we do write um, is realistic and tries to meet people where they are uh, particularly for the younger people. The drug counseling piece helps out your services in this town by the way because uh, you get caught with alcohol or drugs you spend a bunch of money and you go and uh, see somebody at youth services which I got a whole issue with that one right there but, right. but that's another whole story now when we're talking about the young people one of the reasons Tristan that I became a bigger advocate I've never really cared about you know marijuana policies to be honest with you I got my own thing people who watch the show know how I feel mm -hmm. and they know that I do on occasion like to smoke marijuana and, I, and I'm sorry that's just the way it is but one of the things that really <clears throat> changed my whole regard and became more forceful, forceful in trying to change the laws is the fact that we ruin a kid's life. <laughs> Basically at 17 or 18 for maybe a dumb decision, okay? Yeah. He shouldn't have been smoking pot, but now, he's, now he can't get a scholarship, he can't, you know, there's so many things that happen to these people for doing something like that that just, it's not the best way to spend our money. The other thing that I learned, and you're going to learn when you get up there, and you care for a lot of things I do too, a lot of social um, issues to, to take care of those social issues you need money mm -hmm. we are diverting so much money into our criminal justice system and a lot of that is because of the marijuana law we have in this state right. which has got to be changed and and that will be another reason why I hope when you get there you'll see the money $52,000 a year to put somebody in for smoking pot is ridiculous to me absolutely ridiculous and usually we have to let somebody else out or send them out of state at an even higher cost uh, right. for overflow. You know, the other thing... Uh, it's actually lower when we send them out of state. It's a little low, but, but not, the not by much. But, uh, is because, because they don't. They take all the healthy ones. Yeah. They mm -hmm. only take certain ones, and they offer no programming services. We're talking about professionals when we send them out of state. In state, we have a little more sympathy to the people we are right. And it's hard on the families uh, with this out of state uh, prisoning mm -hmm. because you, what do you go to Tennessee to visit? Tennessee, you know, Arizona, or yeah, something. It, 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 that, that really doesn't. Or Greenfield. Well, and I actually want Greenfield. to go back to, to the, the cost factor and, and the interventions there because <clears throat> uh, one of the things that is counterintuitive and, and you know, I don't know enough about this particular issue necessarily to assert that I'm 100% right on this, but I think that the general point is a good one. Um, addiction really impacts a fairly small group of people. Uh, and the people yes. it impacts, yes. it impacts disproportionately large ways. And so, but from a policy perspective, we treat everybody as an addict. And not everybody is an addict. There's lots of people who will never be addicts. And, it's about and, time even a candidate for the legislature is point. saying that. Yeah. Because you're right, addiction is like 3%. Take 100 drug users, out of that 100, maybe 3 or 4% are hardcore addicts. You might have another 5% of some level of abuse in and out. 
but 85% or more of them do not have a problem. But as you're pointing out, policy is made on that little narrow band of addicts, not the 85% who don't have Which a problem. Which is a really good point I haven't heard yet. It is. It is, re, it <laughs> and, is well, and, and actually, I would advocate for spending more money, a disproportionately large share of money on people who are struggling with addiction because the negative impact on society of deep addiction on families, on crime, Without is, the is where the real problem is around substance use in general, abuse in, in general. It's not a, it's not a one-size-fits-all problem. It's not. And we, but the problem, here's what the political problem is, and I think Daryl will, will back me on this. The last thing politicians want to tell the public is we're going to spend more money, disproportionately more money, on people who have the problem, not on preventing you, the innocent person, from being impacted by them. Because mm -hmm. people see that as coddling, they see that as the nanny state, they see that as a waste of taxpayer money on people who are criminals or who don't need our help. And it's the reverse. We actually would be better off really deeply supporting them through their addiction and trying to figure out a way to save their families, their jobs, their businesses, everything else. Um, you know, it's and cheaper do it. than the 52 it's, grand throwing them in jail. It's cheaper, but it's cheaper after several intermediate right. steps. And the public, generally speaking, is not patient enough to wait for that to work. It was true in housing policy. It, they called it the hockey stick problem. It was true in housing policy for homeless people. It's cheaper to rent an apartment for a homeless person and get them into safe housing and then work with them and counsel them and help them get going than it is to let them stay on the streets and mm -hmm. get intermittent services that are very expensive. Um, and so over time, it's actually better policy. But for a significant slice of our population that feels like babying somebody or giving resources to people who are on sort of the wrong side of morality and so you're taking good money away from honest taxpayers and giving it to people who are just sucking it up. Well your, your comments then are really designed to fall within a non-criminal framework. Absolutely. The, the, the extra treatment, the extra monies that go to help that very narrow group of people who yeah. have addiction problems. I'll tell you a way to fund that. <clears throat> Take my theory, forget about decrim, go a step further and legalize it, tax it, and then you can pay for them programs. You can pay for the single-payer system we yep. want in the state of Vermont. When I was looking at statistics back in 19, or 2008 when I got out, the state of Vermont made $78 million in the cigarette tax. Do you not think <laughs> that we can make $78 million more? on a tax on marijuana? I do, okay? Well, and I could be wrong, but I do. $78 million would go a long way, plus, let's go on the other side and think of all the money you just saved, because now you're not putting all these people in prison. Do you know that 75 to 80% fluctuates a little bit of the people in our prison system are there for some drug-related crime, and out of those, 50% of those, the drug is marijuana? Mm -hmm. Do the math. <laughs> Which is the largest really drug of choice, uh, yeah. it, certainly in Vermont. And, and a lot of them, they end up recidiv. It's a recidivism because when they went in to do their drug test or something, they tested positive for marijuana. Right. In Vermont, the last reported figure of uh, marijuana usage in the state was in, I think, in 2007 or 2008, and it reported it at 54,000. In a small state like this, that's a gigantic number, but most reported numbers are underreported. So you can double that number mm -hmm. automatically. Yeah. Um, and also the largest majority of them are really responsible adults uh, who work every day. And as you were mentioning just a moment ago about uh, the issue, part of the economic problems that we have is that we have a thing in this country where politicians run on the notion that I'm going to pr we're going to make jobs. They all mm -hmm. do that. Well, the truth is, there is no, we have like a one person, one vote ratio type thing. We do not have a one job, one person ratio. I don't care how glorified you want to make your search for jobs be, there's going to be a segment of people who will not have jobs no matter what they do because of, of technology and other advancements that, that disallow full 100% employment. So if we did something with our economic model that took that into account, 
uh, you, your economics would change in this state. If you did simple things like uh, legalize marijuana along the alcohol model, right, and do the same thing with hemp in the sense that um, hemp, which should not be illegal yeah. anyway, yeah, um, get our farmers. Look, we have a depressed dairy industry. I'm, I'm ranting now because I know you're going up to the legislature. We have a depressed <laughs> um, the captive audience. All right. This we, is how he does it. Bunch <laughs> on the oh, show I and then just the, <laughs> I see the way it is. We yeah. have a depressed dairy industry in this state, which then um, releases vast tracts of land. Well, you could you could grow hemp on thousands or more acres in this state. Um, we could also have uh, marijuana farms that would provide for the legal system that was set up. And we're talking about Vermont as a state border, which means that if you had the Vermont State Substance Authority then control cigarettes, alcohol, and marijuana. Under those conditions, you, you, you create a whole different way of looking at things. It's a paradigm change that you can't be. Let me ask you, because uh, I know that California tried to, to move more uh, and then the federal government really um, has been a thorn in the side of the California system. And, and so one of the, I guess one of the questions that I have about the policy at the state level is you know, where do we define what is doable within the state and what becomes a federalism issue where the state um, is battling the federal government for jurisdiction. Good. And, and so that, I think, will shape some of what is possible in the near term, yep. largely because I think the federal government hasn't um, moved yet. No, enough. in fact, it's the interest. That's a. What, it's going to take the that, state, so I think, to change the federal. Well, government. you know, that's the, the reason why that's such an important question in our state is because Peter Shumlin. Uh, hopefully will be uh, governor, our Governor Shumlin, uh, we hope, will be reelected. He's a perfect guy to create a liaison with the federal government and begin the breakdown of the intense federal intrusion on state rights. Um, because as a point person, unlike the legislature with all the different voices, he has a single voice. Um, and he uh, spoke at the Marijuana Policy Project fundraiser in New York last week, which, which I attended. And, did, you, uh, what, did you see his speech? Oh, no. I have a, I'm getting a film of it, oh, which good. you folks will see at another time. And uh, he's very articulate. Uh, and uh, and so what we and so and, and now uh, Peter of course is firmly behind uh, D, I mean Governor Shumlin is <laughs> is firmly behind um, uh, a decriminalization and he doesn't advocate legalization at this point but then again he hasn't had a lot of recent talks but with he's not against I, it so and but he's not really against it you see the. The he's governor Shumlin, under, no, doing. that, but 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 he also how do we how do we sell the alcohol model to the states? To me, that's one of the key features um, of all time. So it, it, when we say, can I just by the alcohol model, you mean? Um, the uh, control model. It would be some version of the control model where this in the state of Vermont. Do you mean so? It's because. Uh, wineries and distilleries and uh, breweries are regulated in a different way than the liquor wholesale distribution is That's where right. the state acts as the distributor for wholesale liquor but beer and wine um, are franchise distribution models and distilleries uh, somewhere in between I think yeah. um, that's so. because after the distillery process is when you have your drug called alcohol <laughs> Um, and the same thing would be tr every strata of uh, farming the marijuana, uh, harvesting it, um, getting it, uh, get, getting potency levels established. Uh, that goes moves into packaging. Packaging moves into distribution. Distribution moves takes it to the shelves. And from the shelves, there's a guy with a license behind his back um, and with a heavy fine and jail term if he sells to the underage. Mm -hmm. The same way that happens with uh, with uh, alcohol. So that when alcohol ends up on the shelf, um, nobody fights about that because we already have DW, uh, we have DWI laws. We have uh, if you're going to beat your spouse, underage, that's against the law. Uh, yeah. We have right. underage. They're going to check the, their ID. Well, Same thing with marijuana. Right. And, and what I was trying to get at was 
um, just exactly when you said the alcohol model, whether you meant in the sense that there is a legal age limit and there's a license attached to it and people who sell it and sell it incorrectly have criminal uh, consequences for that, or if you meant on the back end, if you will, of the um, supply chain that the state would be involved in the supply chain because they are involved in the they supply chain right. for, for liquor stores. And yes. so you're finding some balance there and, and really also finding where do you apply a tax because a tax will make money. Um, and you know, in Vermont we have different ways that, that even uh, the liquor tax is applied depending on whether you're uh, a wholesale, if you're a wholesale like bar, right. you buy at a liquor store, right. you don't exactly. pay tax, you pay tax as an end user. Exactly. And so we want to see where do we, where does the revenue stream make the most sense? Where do we have the most control if we implement a system that is maybe growing too big, too fast? You know, then you, right. you probably want the tax at the, at the end user side because like cigarettes, um, you can, with cigarettes, the, the number one behavioral change has been the amount of the tax. You put a two dollar pack tax on a cigarette, it drops by forty percent. Um, you know, so if you if you have the tax system for the Vermont uh, marijuana program in the beginning of the pipeline versus the end, then you have less leverage to control the system. You, you know, know I, I know he's going to be really I'm good for you. a lot of other issues. Yeah, we haven't even talked based about on a lot of the issues. your analysis now because yeah. it's that kind of detail that we have difficulty explaining to the public because it's actually he's fairly complicated walk. in a I'm sense. A walk, yeah. He likes <laughs> policy, whereas I wasn't like that. He's, he's really into policy. Well, stuff. that's that's going to be important because the truth is, as an adult. Um, we, Daryl and I are. I mean, Daryl has six kids. I mean, you know. I mean, you know. We, we, we're both. We're They're both all pretty good. Five of them went to college. There you go. They work. And I it, work. I do a lot of a right. lot of other stuff. But yeah. So I we're interested like in number one drink. protecting underage people to help buffer and mm -hmm. underpine their future. The other one is to uh, is to for adult consumption treat us like adults, not thirteen year olds, right. and make it available to adults along the alcohol model and, uh, and and with reasonable taxation, with strident licensing control and protection. Now I'm not saying that Vermont's going to end up having marijuana cafes like you have. Uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, I don't know about that, but certainly as an adult product that's packaged and made available to me, I'm 63 years old. I don't need to be treated like a 13 year old. I want to go into the store, look at my potency packages, where it came from, things like that. I want to know that it's been safely grown, it's not mixed or cut with anything, that the product that I'm getting yeah, and I'm is. I'm sorry um, to interrupt you, no, but not we just all. had the police go downtown to the underground because they're selling that synthetic stuff. That's synthetic, That's actually yes. hurting people, okay? Right. So, synthetic. I mean, and this is what's happening out there, folks, because right. we have no marijuana policy. Right. Now we can have people do their own thing. Now, right. listen, we've only got two we've minutes left. We've got a couple left. more minutes. Let's let Tristan finish the well, show off. Actually, I want to just <clears throat> say something that, that made me think of, which is really interesting. So in our addiction model treatment, uh, when it becomes criminal, uh, people are... Uh, if they are in a mandatory treatment program, they're tested for drug consumption and alcohol. We treat marijuana for them the same as if they used heroin or anything else, which is why mm -hmm. that drug was of interest at um, because it's it it's supposed to give you a marijuana like high, but not appear in the Your, tests. Right. Right. And in right. fact, they just do now have a new test that does test for it for people who are in those programs. But again, right. here's another way in which, you know, a system that's really built around, one part of the system that's really built around trying to steer people through addiction and the consequences thereof um, is actually creating a market for a whole other product. That's right. Because we're right. not connecting the dots and pulling everything together. It's yeah, a push down, pop up type thing and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it can really wreck right. uh, everything. Well, <laughs> you know, now yeah. we have well, we have another minute. And I think we should just say that congratulations on your on your winning well, of the, the primary. primary only. Yep, I and let's still get, get you yeah, in, let's get you sure into you're gonna get in. November and get you uh, and and have you up there because I think our listeners on, this is just one topic. Now remember, Tristan is going to uh, be well versed in many I don't things. Lie to him. Listen to Steve West when he's on. And if he can be if he can be this well versed, uh, he's going to help. 
our Vermonters quite a bit. Let's get him up there and see what we can get from him because we need you to work for us, and I think he's going to work oh, for man. us. And we're, and I don't and mean marijuana. I know marijuana is a lot, but he's in on food issues, health care, you name it. <clears throat> Tristan's right there, and like I said, he's a policy wonk, so we understand okay. what he's talking about. Well, we'll that, on, be, on behalf we of Marijuana Resolve Show, BCTV, thank you all for viewing in, and uh, we'll have Tristan back to tell you more of what he's doing. So thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. Yep.